Okay, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to wherever you're watching this from. My name is Fanuel, Chief Resident here at SAI. I'm so excited to open our 2022 series of seminars with Sarah Dunifat. Um, so for those of you who do not know, we host these monthly sessions um, with um, speakers and experts from around the world. And so um, Sarah is our in-house expert. So she actually opened this uh, session last year. And so we wanted to have, have her back and open it again, talking about evaluation. So before we get going, I want to tell you a little bit about what I do here at SAI uh, in my lab. And this is one of the traditions we are hoping to start moving forward, where we have our current resident introduce the speaker. And in doing so, they talk about their work and then introduce a speaker. So what am I doing here at SAI? So let me show you this. This is my lab. So within SAI, when I'm not thinking about SAI in terms of let's how, how are we going to make this operation work and what are we doing, who's what, where, and when, I run the M lab, the Mwindi lab. And what we focus on uh, is really looking at the connection between people and science and asking uh, the idea about how do we engineer new approaches to enhance those connections. Okay, and so we look at this from an engineering point of view and also from a research point of view. Uh, here's a link at the bottom if you're curious to learn more about what we do and all the projects we've launched and the work that we have done. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little sneak peek. Okay, this is still top secret, but it won't be secret anymore. But this is uh, just one figure that some of you may have seen in Slack. So if you haven't seen this, that means you're not paying attention to your Slack channels. However, so if you if you don't if you don't don't know the uh, NSF has this thing called the Advancing Informal STEM Learning Initiative, a wonderful program, biggest funder of what we call informal STEM learning. What is that? These are informal learning in terms of uh, spaces that are not in the formal classroom. So museums, uh, if you think about podcasts and all these things, and they fund a ton of these things each year. I mean, it's intense. You should go on their website, uh, informalscience.org. Actually, you can see a lot of those funded projects. And here's the kicker. They publish all the reports. So I know Sarah is always in there. I am too, studying them away. And so just cut the story short. This They fund pilots, they fund research, they fund innovations, broad implementation, lit reviews, you name it. And so we asked a very simple question. Who have they funded? And we want to look at this over a long period of time, 15 year period. So here's a figure that uh, a research associate um, that started in my lab, uh, Heidi has been working on. And again, this is still in the works. And we just looked at states, who is getting the most money? Because that was an interesting question. It turns out California, Massachusetts, where I live, uh, is getting a lot of these grants. And, and so it's interesting uh, to, to have that um, uh, come up. And so you can look at these figures here, part B, where we see these kind of high um, award states. And here's the kicker, when you look at it across time, right, and you get to see these very interesting temporal patterns, right, the ups and downs. And, the, and I think if you start looking at the other ones, you can see some of those who are coming up and those that are plateaued and those who are also coming down. It's really, really, really cool. So I will stop there, but so stay tuned for the formal report that we're gonna be releasing very, very shortly. And so this is something, um, uh, the database itself, by the way, is publicly available. You know, and you can go down there and download it yourself. Absolutely insane to download 15 years worth of data. Heidi was, I mean, she's been working and chumming away at the data, so it's super exciting. So with that, it beautifully leads into Sarah's work because uh, ASL is something that Sarah um, is exposed to heavily, both in her own uh, body of work through in, uh, improved insights. And, and I think we we talked a lot about this, Sarah, in evaluation. And a big piece of those ASL grants that get awarded is evaluation. And all those reports, by the way, they're all published. You can take a look at them. They come in all shapes and sizes. And a big component, again, to getting assessment of what's going on. Surveys are really a big, big instrument. you know. And I think um, Sarah is really thankful that you wanted to get a look at uh, open the hood, shall we say, and, and uh, take a retake a look at the survey again. So Sarah is our in-house evaluator um, expert, and she also um, runs her own company and the founder of Improved Insights, and is also going to school, but I'll stop there. She may share more information about herself. So Sarah, welcome, and looking forward to your session. 
Thank you so much, Manuel. And actually, I'm a reviewer for the NSF ASIL grant. So all of what I'm speaking about today will kind of mesh really nicely with that. Um, that, so we'll that is amazing. Ahead. Wow. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Some insider info here. Um, <laughs> all right, great. Well, thank you so much for having me again. Um, as Fenwell said, I'm Sarah Dunifin. I am the founder and principal evaluator of Improved Insights, and I'm also the evaluation officer here at SAI. And today's presentation is all about going beyond the survey and thinking about different creative methodologies that we can employ to make um, our practices a little bit better and to get the data that we need. So um, just a little bit of background on me so you can understand my perspective and where I'm coming from. Um, I personally have been an educator, an educational program manager, and an evaluator, both internal and external. And I've worked with groups like museums, nonprofits, um, K-12 schools and universities, as well as government agencies. I've also done some work doing STEM equity in higher education. And my educational background is quite varied. I've done you know, some work in anthropology, international relations, biology is my, my STEM outpost. And I'm currently a doctoral student at University of Pittsburgh studying out of school learning. Um, like Fanuel said, I'm really focused on that informal STEM education evaluation through my firm, Improved Insights, and that's really focused on just helping organizations to understand what's happening in their programs and to communicate the impacts of their work. So why did I want to design a presentation all around going beyond the survey? Well, in my practice, I've really seen that when folks think of evaluation, they often think of a survey. It is what we know, we love, we know how to use it, we employ it. And so a lot of people default to thinking that that is the method, the only method that they should be or need to be using. And I'm very much of the camp that um, we need to think a little bit more creatively and broadly about how we're collecting the data that we need. And oftentimes it's not a survey that will best suit us and, and suit our needs. Um, and what's more, there are lots of creative methodologies that we can explore and tinker with and see if they give us better data, if they connect better with our audiences. And so we should definitely seize the opportunity to do that. So in today's session, we are going to cover a couple different things. We're going to look broadly at different creative methodologies beyond the survey. Uh, we're going to do an in-depth look at five different like, case study examples of methods in practice. We're going to chat about what different things you need to be thinking about when you're thinking about what methodologies to choose for evaluation. And then we're going to do a little bit of discussion around your challenges, your interests, things you've tried, things that have worked, not worked, um, advice that you're looking for, all of that good stuff. So to kick us off here, and because I can't really see the chat super well while I'm presenting, I'm hoping Fanuel can kind of jump in here and collect that data for us. I'd love if you could put into the chat um, both the audience that you're thinking about as well as what you're hoping to collect data on. And that could be a specific construct like self-efficacy in STEM, or it could be more general. It could be something like satisfaction in the program or knowledge gain, what are they learning? But just even in your own words, feel free to just put it in there. What's your audience? And what are you hoping um, to collect data on? And that'll help us later when we get to that discussion section to um, possibly structure the conversation around those things. Thanks for doing that. All right, so as you're doing that, I'm gonna start on um, a little bit of framing for how we start to think about what methodologies might be the best fit for the work we're doing. And oftentimes, before we jump into choosing actual methods that sound interesting, we need to think about the um, context of our project. So this is both, the evaluation questions that you probably have devised, but also, you know, why are you doing this evaluation work? Are you collecting data for your own internal program improvement purposes? Are you collecting data um, because it's required of you for a grant um, to, to show partners and collaborators and funders the impact of your work? Starting with that why is gonna be really helpful for you in framing out the rest of what you're doing and how that fits together. 
So for example, if you're reporting for a large federal grant, you might want to think about using more validated measures and mixed methods. Whereas if you're reporting to your board or community members, qualitative data, which really paints a picture and tells a story might be a good route. If you're working on improving your programs and will not be reporting the data, methods focused around assessing your own programs or practices might be best versus something like self-report, um, which we'll get into that later. And these are all mites. You know, so much of this is really, really dependent on your specific questions, your specific programs, your context. So it's hard to make any blanket statements of what you should do when um, super specifically without knowing that background info. But I am trying to give you some ideas of the things that you can think about in order to suss out what's gonna be right for you and your audience. And so that includes thinking about things like, do I need to look for validated instruments? Do I need to look for adapted instruments or create new instruments? Um, do I want qualitative data, quantitative data, mixed methods? And one thing I will say on this point too, kind of both on the what type of data and what type of instrument is um, Dr. Aisha Boyce has made a really great point. She's a STEM education evaluator and researcher. She's made a really great point on the validity of instruments, which is that if you are um, validating an instrument in a specific context, and then you're applying that instrument in a different context, it is no longer valid. So I think sometimes in social science and the scientific community, we think that validated instruments are always the best way to go. And they might not be if the audience and the context that that instrument is validated in is quite different from where you hope to use it. And so that's why we have to think about you know, do I always go for that packaged survey that's been validated or do I create something new for my audience knowing the specific context that they rest in? Right, so here I have our overhead view of 20 different methodologies that um, are typically used in evaluation. I'm sure some of them will look familiar to you. Some of them are probably less familiar. Feel free to screenshot this if you'd like or just reference it later. But I'm going to walk through them all um, a, a little bit quickly so we can get to those case studies. So first off, surveys, very familiar to us, right? And we're looking beyond the survey here. So we might think about interviews, probably also pretty familiar, pre-post tests. So you're giving an assessment um, to your audience before and after an intervention to see if anything has changed. Usually that focuses on something like content knowledge um, or maybe attitudes. Focus groups, so it's quite similar to interviews, you're just doing it in a group setting. The difference with those two is what type of data are you looking for? If you're, if you're gonna be asking really sensitive or personal questions, one-on-one -on -one is probably your best bet. If you're wondering how the group is um, reacting to something or how they might play off of each other or um, you know, if the discussion element is important, then a focus group might be your better bet gallery walks. So this is a great interactive um, evaluation technique where if you're able to gather in person, you would put up large like post-it notes, those really big ones on the wall around your meeting room with perhaps different questions or prompts on them. Then you would have folks circle through the room answering or providing their feedback on that question or prompt. And they can also um, agree or disagree with the responses of others. So you can devise something where um, they'll stick their response up there on a small sticky note. If folks agree, they can put a plus one by it. If they disagree, they can put a thumbs down, a minus one, whatever. You make the rules on that. But it's a way to collect both um, feedback from the individual and feedback from the individuals reflecting on each other's um, points of view. Embedded assessments. So this is something you see used a lot in formal education. It's quite simply when you know the teacher asks the room, raise your hand after this lesson if you can name two things that a, a mammal has that's characteristic of a mammal. Raise your hand and then you can do kind of a, a quick scan of the room. Okay, it looks like 75% of the people in the room have raised their hand. That gives me a good sense of where we're at with the content. That's how it's typically used in formal education, but you can use it 
um, in informal education as well, just as a part of your program. So you can do these quick assessments and they don't have to be super informal. You can actually write down the numbers of people who are able to raise their hand to something or who vote one way or another. Um, but it's a, it's a nice way to put it right into the program so that it's not an additional ask for audiences. That's a great one for younger um, students. Document review, um, analysis frameworks and rubrics. So this is a, a set of methods where you're looking at um, actual lesson plans or documents that you've created and you're assessing those for the presence or absence of certain elements. So you could look at uh, skill building and programs, looking at this curriculum, where are we offering opportunities for students to develop their social and emotional learning? Is it embedded in the curriculum? Um, you can look at program delivery, alignment between curriculum and program goals. This as like a set of methodologies is a really nice way to collect information without it being an additional ask on the audience because much of this can happen behind the scenes or um, just with resources that you've already created. So you're not always like over surveying your audience. I'm Sarah. Mind I think Yes. I think this is great as you're going through these, you know, so in the yes. chat, uh, we've had a lot of entries actually regarding the different audiences that everybody uh, is targeting. Great. I think that, that plays right well into what methods do you choose, right? It depends on the audience, it depends on what you're looking at. Absolutely. Um, so I encourage everybody else in the chat here to look at these, just the diversity. I think that's what's really amazing for me, Absolutely. diversity, what people are looking at and their audiences. I'm happy to read them out, Sarah, but just they're there. Just want to let you know. Great. Yeah, I will check them out um, in a minute here. And we will go in a little bit more into like, what are the things you think about to choose? This is very much just an overhead of look at the possibilities that are available to you. And if one of these does sound interesting to you or you connect with it, I would say, look it up and get some more advice on it because my one to two sentences on it on each is not probably enough but um that's some that's some good background thanks Benwell. um so mind maps and concept maps those are um when you ask somebody to think about all the things that come up regarding a certain concept and to visually map that out and i actually one of our case studies is that so you'll see an example of that Photo voice is a really interesting technique where you have folks take photos of things, usually in response to a prompt, and then maybe they would um, journal or write a reflection on why they took a photo of that thing. That's a really great method to use um, with, uh, with a younger audience as well to get them involved in the, in the data and meaning making process. Drawing assessments. So if you've heard of the draw a scientist study, pretty similar to that, right? So that study was one in which um, students were asked to draw what their perception of a scientist was. And I don't remember when the initial one was, the 90s maybe, but uh, folks were really drawing, you know, the older white male in the lab coat. That was their view with the crazy hair, very Einstein-esque. They recreated that study as of late and it's showing much more diversity. So that is a great um, change to see, but we can use that in regard to different concepts that we're hoping that our audience learns as well. And one of our case studies will go more in depth on that. Timing and tracking is a method that's used in museums quite often where we're actually timing and tracking the movement of visitors around a space to see where they're spending time, what they're looking at, what interactives they're engaging with, et cetera. You can also mine your existing data. Um, we know that folks are so over surveyed these days. So whenever you have data that you can use in new and creative ways, I always encourage you to do so. Journaling, um, especially, <laughs> and I will say like, you will need to let them know this is not a private journal if you're gonna be looking at it. Um, but if you have, uh, an audience going through your program and reflecting on their experience, that can be a really interesting um, set of data. So you can definitely look at that as well. Photo card discussions. This is one where you might have different photos of, of different things related to a theme and you put them out and you ask folks to choose ones that relate most closely to their perception based on a prompt. So what do you think of when you think of um, climate change? And they can grab a card and then explain why they picked that. It's great for getting the conversation started. 
sticker voting on scale with scales or feedback. So you can use this um, both virtually and in person. In person, it would look at it would look like having um, maybe a graph up on the wall. And then you actually vote with your sticker and plot live where your data point would be. And then you can see a nice compendium of everyone's data point at the end. You can do voting with objects visually. I've seen this done on um, like zoos and aquariums grounds actually, where there will be different canisters for different responses and folks will put a little bouncy ball or whatever object into that and you can see the proportions change over time with different visitors voting. And you've probably seen this in action at your coffee shop where they have a pick one, you know, what's better, Star Trek, Star Wars, you vote. Very simple um, example of that. Observations. So this can be during the program, during a visit to a certain space. What are visitors doing? What are your participants doing? Do they look engaged? Um, what behaviors are they um, showing? all of that. Logs and reflections. This can be for your participants or for anyone else involved in the program. So I've had um, education staff actually do logs after delivering programs to reflect on some of the um, themes that we were interested in for our evaluation questions. Photo analysis, which we will have an example of later. So actually asking participants to take photos of things and, and send them to you or tag them on social media, and then you can analyze all of the photos collected. And UX walkthrough. So if you have a website and that's your main platform, you can interview people live, have them walk through the website and narrate what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and all of that is really crucial and important data for you. Okay, so that's our bird's eye view. Now we're going to get a little bit more into the actual case studies. So I have five of these with just different novel methods that I've used or seen myself. Um, the first is timing and tracking. So I explained that a little bit in the context of maybe a museum exhibit. Here is an example of how it was used at an outdoor nature play space. So we had this new nature play space that we wanted to evaluate. It had a bunch of different nature play elements scattered throughout the space. And we did observations for timing and tracking where we watched visitors and we tracked what um, interactives they approached in what order, how long they spent at each interactive. Um, we tracked some other things too, like what was the group dynamic? Was it a family group, an individual? Um, as well as we did some interviews with them. But this element I thought was really interesting because you can see what the flow in the space looks like. You can see what interactive folks are really um, attracted to and want to spend their time at. And that could have some um, important insights for the designers of that space or for the educators that staff that space. You can see with the size and um, color density of the dot where most subjects made a spot and at what point in time. So the first image is their first stop. Most of them were stopping at the interactive right by the entrance. Second stop, it was more scattered. Third stop, it was, you know, at the exit, we're done, we're out of here. Um, and so you can kind of see the flow of activity there. Drawing assessment. So similar to that draw a scientist. Uh, this is one we did with school children. I believe they were like third or fourth grade where we asked them about their um, perception on kind of like urban wildlife in their neighborhood. This was on Coney Island. They drew the Coney Island beach before a year long student and teacher partnership program um, with us and as you can see on the left, the original drawing had very little wildlife displayed. They really didn't see or be able to identify anything that was in their um, view. And we had them at the bottom explain what they drew. And so you can see the perception of this at, at first was very focused on what people do in this space and the physical elements there. Uh, the second one here is after that school year program had ended, same student drew that space again. And this time you can see a lot more detail. Um, certain things are pointed out. I know it's a little bit fuzzy, but you can see seashells, starfish, dolphin, which may not be accurate, ocean, um, rocks, sky, etc. 
and uh, they're in the description below. There's a little bit of a reference to pollution and littering. So being a little bit more um, aware of some of the conservation issues that are affecting their own neighborhood. Sarah, we have a question from Jonathan. Jonathan, go, go ahead. Go for it, yes. Hi, Sarah, nice to meet you. And sorry, I was late from another meeting, um, but I right. appreciate your, appreciate your uh, um, presentation very much. So I'm really glad you covered this right here because I have to do some, um, some analyses of, of pictures like mm. this. What yeah. you just described and how you compare the two images was mm -hmm. a grounded theory analysis uh, followed by some themes. Mm -hmm. Is that um, accepted in the literature when looking at elementary school kids uh, drawings? Is there another way I should approach that? Because that's how I was thinking of doing it. But I'm just wondering, I don't have much experience with drawings. I have yes. lots of experience with words, focus groups, surveys, <laughs> you name it, sure. but not drawings. So sure. um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, Thanks. and I will say, yes, thank you for the question, Jonathan. I will say um, I did this project probably five years or more at this point ago. So things might have changed since then, but at the point in time when I was constructing this, there was very little to reference in the literature for this age group in this type of study. So I did not have a great basis to start with there. I will say that we took um, these images and devised rubrics around them to assess the number of different species they were able to identify and other elements like that. So there was a very standard way in which we coded the drawings, but I can't speak too much to what it's grounded in simply because there wasn't very much that existed at that point in time that I was able to access. So this was a little bit of pulling from some other evaluation studies that existed at that time, plus kind of a little bit of creative experimentation of our own. Okay, thank you. No, that helps a lot. Appreciate sure. it. Thanks. This is actually a cool thing as well, Jonathan, we're thinking for our library, we can, I think, do some scouring and get some more um, published work yeah. if there is some now five years have passed since you did this uh, there to see what what's new and what's accepted, you know. Yeah, well, the good, sounds great. the good news is grounded theory doesn't run out of style, right? I mean, you can do that anytime. But what I was, and you said you created a rubric, and that implies to me that you have to get the rubric validated and that, you know, that's, mm. that's a whole nother issue. Um, but yeah. I, I'm wondering, yeah. like it in in papers that are that are published about this type of data analysis, is like is grounded theory sufficient? Because if so, that's great. I mean, I can, you know, I can run with that. Um, the um, but but there's so much variability in drawings, right? Mm -hmm. you no, know, if if I'm looking at words, the words are the words, right? But when one person looks at a drawing versus another person looks at a drawing. The interpretation of art is very, very subjective. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if, when I pull out themes from words and coding in, in, in that sense, I can start very um, quantitatively and just doing a, a word count to start to get me going. Mm -hmm. I can't do that with a picture. So, right, um, right. Anyway, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on your experience. And, Fenwell, if, you know, if, if our library could look that up, that would be really helpful. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that is the struggle with this. Um, again, I'm trying to think back to like five years ago. I know we did some inter-rater reliability and had multiple people coding. Um, we also had the kids actually write what the elements were in their drawing. You can see a little bit on the left, there's boardwalk and then there's more on the right. So we weren't doing as much um, interpretation ourselves, but we were having the kids draw and then label. So yeah, that is the tricky part to stay with elements that are pretty precise and would be kind of perceived the same way between people versus things that, as you say, you might have a little bit more creative license to interpret. Um, yeah, that, that well, is and, an interesting. It sounded like once you said once you said rubric, you're more on the thematic analysis side where you're looking yes. for specific codes and you're going into the data looking for something, right? Um, so whereas for my scientific question, I need to be more grounded theory where I'm just trying to figure out what what is it that came out of that. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, I, I found the drawing to be a hard analysis. It was harder than I thought. Mm. Yeah, anyway. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'll say for this project, too, this was 
um, an evaluation done largely for internal program improvement. So we didn't actually get the the measure um, validated. It was just kind of like we did some inter inter rater reliability work, but other than that, um, not too much. It was for this project alone. We didn't try to publish. All right, so on to the next one here. So document analysis. Um, this is another great, like more hands off of the audience type of method. And this is from SAI's very own Millennial Science. So what we did here is we looked at um, different pieces of curriculum for the presence or absence of the next generation science standards, science and engineering practices. So rather than asking the audience directly, which if it's a youth audience is gonna be kind of challenging, hey, did you use mathematics and computational thinking? <laughs> uh, what we can do is actually look at the curriculum and say, does the curriculum give opportunity for these skills to be practiced or give opportunity for these practices um, to, to be engaged with by the audience? So it's a way of kind of flipping how you're thinking about the data collection from that self-report, which is always reliant on the audience themselves, to the things you can do on your back end. So it's not that additional ask on um, the folks that you are serving. And mind maps. So this is the one I had spoken a little bit about earlier, where you give a word and then you have folks think about all of the things that they perceive to be connected to that word. So this is just one in isolation, but um, we had this as a series of before and after of um, a group of teens that were doing conservation education programming. And so we asked them, what do you think about when you think of conservation? And we did that before and after, this is our after, so it's a little bit more extended. And then we can look at the difference in what terms are they choosing? How many different terms were they able to identify? Are there any interesting themes in what they're thinking about? That'll reflect for us if the content that we were teaching them um, stuck. And also what is their ability to think about these concepts on a more um, like developed level? Are they thinking about things beyond kind of that first step? And so you can think there's a little bit, or you can see that there's a little bit of that going on um, right here. It's a great technique to use with youth if you're just trying to get a sense for their perception on a concept. And photo analysis. So this is from an organization called Literati, where they asked folks to find a piece of litter, photograph it, post it on Instagram, and hashtag it with Literati, then to throw away, recycle, or compost that piece of litter. And then the group from Literati went through all those photos and analyzed them for themes so we can see what type of litter folks are really running across. And so they found lots of plastic, lots of cigarettes, paper, um, more cigarettes, plastic bottles, etc. So those are some kind of more in-depth examples of creative methods, but the key tips I would say for thinking about how to align your methods with your needs are to make it accessible to your audience. So that includes being developmentally appropriate for the group that you're working with, making it culturally appropriate. And I always try to not make it too much of an ask. You know, folks are over surveyed these days. So if you're giving them the 20 page survey, they're not gonna wanna do it. So how can you make it accessible and easy for your audience to give you the feedback that you need? making it unobtrusive so it doesn't direct, detract from the experience. So again, if you can use for survey example, a short survey versus a 25 question survey, that's great. If you can do something and it makes sense on site versus after the fact so that they're just done with it, that can be great. Um, and if you can do something unobtrusive like an observation protocol versus like interviews, that's another technique um, where you're a little bit more hands-off. And of course, the key to everything is just making it align with your program goals and your data needs. So if you do need those validated instruments, you are reporting you know, a little bit of more robust study, you're gonna approach it a little bit differently than if you don't, and if you're doing this more for kind of program improvement sake. And then always consider your audience context and constructs. So for your audience, these are things like, uh, is it a youth audience or an adult audience? If it's youth, what age? That's where some of that developmentally appropriate um, comes in. Is it a protected group? If you've done your social science um, city training, you know all about that. 
Uh, do you share cultural identity or language with the group that you're working with? If not, what, what considerations might you have to build into your evaluation plan to make sure that you're collecting data in an appropriate way and also a way where you understand um, exactly where they're coming from? Context. So if you're doing some data collection in school or out of school, it's going to be very different how you approach it high or low commitment program or offering. So is this a program where um, you're seeing folks every day over an entire year? Or is it a program where you're seeing them once? Or is it a social media or like a YouTube video where they might drop in and watch one? It's gonna be very different what you choose. Time span, so one day, week, month, year, virtual in person. And then constructs, so how you measure and what you measure it really revolves around that. So what's the data that you're looking for that you need? Are you looking for feelings, attitudes, behaviors, content knowledge, skills, satisfaction? Um, those things might have different techniques and approaches that you use. And I have a couple examples of that as well. So uh, these are kind of imaginary examples that are born a bit from personal experience. So one example here is you'd like to collect data from a set of ninth grade students, and because of the stringent rules in the school district pertaining to student data, you'll be asking their teacher to collect the data rather than you going in to collect the data. Since you're planning to do a focus group, the teacher will be privy to anything said, therefore there's no real confidentiality for these students. And student responses may be different than if you had a stranger um, collecting the data. So this is where we introduce things like social desirability bias or the fact that they're going to want to impress their teacher, right? There's a relationship there. So that would really affect your data and you might want to think about ways to collect that data um, to provide that confidentiality and to avoid that social desirability bias. Another example, you plan on collecting data from the audience, adult audience on your YouTube videos, but since most comments are anonymous, you have no way of knowing if the viewers are truly adults or if they are youth. You also have no way to follow up with them to send them a survey since you do not have contact information for them. So something like a survey or something like an interview might not even be possible with this group if you can't get in contact with them. So maybe you look at doing something like analyzing comments left, something that's just available to you a little bit more readily. One final, you hope that your program is changing your participants' self-advocacy in STEM. However, your program only lasts two weeks and for just a few hours per week. Is it reasonable to expect that type of intervention to change one's belief in their own abilities? What other ways could you understand what changes are occurring as a result of your program? So if you had a chance to watch the video I did last year about the ISEE framework, that was looking a little bit in the, at the scope and depth of impact in different constructs that, that programs can have. And something important to keep in mind is always what is a reasonable um, outcome to expect of the program that you're running. So if it is one of those really small scale short term programs, your depth of impact is not going to be as much as if it's this um, engaging day after day program that goes on for one year or two years, etc. And as a little refresher, when I'm talking about constructs, what am I talking about? It could be any of these things here. So it could be things like interest, engagement, interest, attitude. It could be content knowledge, learning. It could be STEM skills, 21st century skills, behavior, science, capital, career path activation, social, emotional learning, satisfaction, and more. So these are just some examples here. But when you're thinking about what data am I trying to collect, it is helpful if you can kind of narrow it in on some of these things. Um, where there is a ton of published research and validated measures as well that you can employ. And this is a good interesting point, uh, Sarah. So you, you don't have to make it up yourself right from scratch. You don't have to. Sometimes it makes more sense to do that though, um, yeah. but not always. And so if you can take something that somebody else has validated and it's for a very similar audience that you're gonna be using it with, hey, it's done already, no need to reinvent the wheel. You can also adapt validated measures for your needs and kind of pick and choose a little bit, and then you can also create new. So there's kind of a spectrum that you can um, play with there. And Fanwell, I think if it sounds good with you, we might do some discussion. 
yeah, I think we can just do a group discussion. Yeah, I think the audience, I'm just looking at the comments from earlier. Um, there's enough content there to break down that, that spectrum that you're thinking about, right? The youth and yeah. adult and people can just jump in and share, um, like answer the questions that you have set out. Totally. So I'm just going to read through them quickly here. So you've got med students, science communication skills, grad students, postdocs, learning gains, students and teachers, accessibility of material, utility, usage, and locality, high school science teachers, so game-based learning and STEM, um, K-12 teachers, knowledge, implementation, application of STEM skills, 21st century skills, undergrad, PhD students, science policy training opportunities. Awesome. So we have quite a varied group of audiences and of constructs. And so now would be a great time if anyone has um, either reflections on things they've tried in the past that have worked for them, haven't worked for them, any of those methods that I've mentioned that you've personally employed that you're like, this worked great, we'd love to hear it. Or if you have needs or questions, things you're struggling with, hey, I'm working with a third grade audience, I don't think that surveys are going to work for me, what's the best method to choose for that age group? And again, a lot of that depends on the specifics, so I don't know how uh, in detail we can get with all of those right now, but if you have some general thoughts and questions, I can try my best to provide um, that now, and we can also share as a group. So if you have a great solution for, for somebody in the group who asked a question, please raise your hand, speak up. We'd love to hear it. So Peter says, um, I use self-report. If med students spend time trying to be better teachers and communicators, they think they got better, but did they? Interesting. Yeah, and so that's... Yeah, yeah so I'm, just, I'm just trying to move beyond self-report surveys. That's all totally. I ever see when people have science communication things. They say, mm -hmm. oh, we did this seminar or oh, we did this thing and people became better science communicators. And there's right. really very, I'm having a really hard time finding anything that is an empirical measure of uh, science communication skills. And I don't know enough social science stuff to yeah. get like the communication world, which I'm guessing there's some things that exist there just in terms of communication skills more broadly. Um, but right. I, I'm looking into that right now and trying to figure out what I can do different. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Peter. That's a really interesting question. And I know Claire's on the call. Claire, Claire works in SciComm as well. So I'm wondering if she has, has had this challenge as well. Um, but I would, I mean, my initial thought is, is there any way to design like an observation rubric? If there is somebody working with the med students who sits in on maybe visits that they're having with patients and or, you know, I'm not sure what the context of this is, if this is the med students presenting research or talking with patients, but like whatever it is, is there a third party that could sit in with a pre-designed rubric that looks at specific elements that you would say is good science communication and did they do those things? So it could be things like asking if they have any questions or using an analogy or you know whatever that looks like and there could be some really nice measures that have already been developed in the in that realm for like an observation rubric okay yeah no I, I, and that would be easy we're having them go out and teach middle school students about mm. science concepts and so yeah that would be yeah that would be good. yeah yeah and you could also think about is there any data you could collect from the middle school students or the teachers you might not see progress made in the in the med students themselves, like a before and after, but you could ask things like, did like, I mean, very plainly, did, did this make sense to you? Right. Or like, what do you still have questions about? And if there's a big gap there, if they say, I don't understand any of this, I mean, that's a pretty good indicator that it wasn't communicated in yeah. the way that they needed it to be. So yeah, you can kind of expand beyond the med students themselves. Perfect. Yeah, some great comments in the chat here. I think this is a very important topic about the self-report and um, Claire added in like, it's a huge challenge. Evaluators are trying to tackle this with more experiment types of psychom studies. So I think the way I think of it is too, you can look at that spectrum, right? Of um, if, you, if you do an experiment or study um, from one side, maybe more on the self-report or um, sort of data that's already available to more stringent ones where you think about publishing stuff, right? As a mm -hmm. comparison group, 
uh, that is matched <laughs> and all these things that absolutely then you get then you get way more sort of intense um, and most people just don't have the facilities and the resources uh, to do that yeah yep. and rose had a really great point in the chat as well um if there's some sort of pre post activity they could do for example explain the neurons in the brain in two sentences and see how that shifts before and after the program so i love that um you could also do that mind map concept or you know if I mean, depending on the content they're presenting, maybe an illustration, can they actually draw the diagram for the brain and identify the different parts? Like whatever that looks like, the more interactive you can make it for the students, the more they're gonna like that. Yeah, one of the things that, that so I, 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 some of the things you guys are saying are all little things that I've seen like an inkling of this idea. So I like the idea of tapping into the middle school students and the middle school teachers and just having them evaluate um, how this went is a, a really easy one that we hadn't done and so i think we're going to work on on building that in um the idea of this pre-post one group did a study where they basically had some had i forget who the population was but they said here's all the information you need to teach this concept and they gave them like three different options to choose from so you could pick whatever you were most comfortable with um and then they had to present that with like 15 minutes to prepare or something and they did like a, a little video recording of them and then kind of switched on uh, and did it again after all whatever the training was. That nice. seems super intensive, and I don't know how many med students I'm going to get on board with doing that. Is my is my <laughs> with that one? But I love the idea, getting that pre post. Yeah. Oh, and Rosario, I agree. So in the chat, um, she put depending on the age group, I think drawing exercises may be useful. Yep. Jonathan says self-reflection of teachers in comparison to stakeholders, students reflection of what they learned works really well as well as pre post. Yep. And you could think about with the med students too, um, having them do a like post visit log or journal or reflection of what went well and what didn't. So you're not necessarily looking at as exacting of their growth, you know, like a pre post would be or self report would be, but you're looking at the kinds of things they're thinking about and noticing and how that changes. Yeah, I like that idea too. Awesome. All right, I, I've monopolized the time long enough. You get, you get. <laughs> well, I think we have time for one or two more folks. So if anyone else has a question or comment, please. Okay. Uh, when so, applying for, oh, I was going to say, um, I think I saw a comment earlier from Nasha. I forgot what it what she said, but um, it's something that reminded me of the construct you were talking about um, earlier, Sarah. That mm. you know, um, it's just good to hear that these things are still ruminating, right? I think last time when you presented, that was still kind of being worked on, right? Mm. These constructs. Yeah. So have they gained a foothold? Is that what you're saying now? They're kind of static. Um, so these constructs are widely accepted and there are researchers who study just like one construct exactly, um, like K.N. Renninger studies science interest, I believe, for example. Um, this framework that I was talking about is still under construction. We had a conference about it talking about, you know, is this something that folks could use in practice? And there was a lot of feedback from the evaluators, the researchers, and the practitioners that attended, and Fenwell attended as well. Um, and now they have incorporated that feedback and are thinking about what the next iteration of this might look like. So it's still in progress. It's not finalized by any means, but all of those constructs are widely studied constructs that are accepted in this space. And I would say if you're you know, applying for a grant and you specifically mention those constructs, you're on good solid footing because um, folks like to see that you're getting pretty specific about what you're hoping to do and how you're hoping to measure it. And that kind of ties into um, Nasha's comment just now, when applying for programs like ASIL, can any of these methods be used to present data or quantitative methods still preferred? I would say mixed methods are probably preferred. And I would say always ground what you're proposing to do in established work. That doesn't mean you always have to do validated instruments, but it does mean that you do have to explain why you chose a certain methodology and what it its origin is, what it's grounded in, um, especially in the space that, you, that you're working on. Um, so 
Yeah, if you do you have any more specifics on that with the presenting data? Nisha? Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, I'm at the last one trying to be a little bit quiet. But um, yeah, I was just going back to the drawing um, example that you showed before. It's it's really cool. But then if, if I show something like that, um, like I think Jonathan mentioned, um, how do I explain what I see? Uh, it's my interpretation or it's mm -hmm. really what they were intended to to uh, say. So that, that's why I was kind of asking about yeah. 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 I mean, I think if you're going to do a drawing assessment, you have to go into it with a really solid structure up front. So understanding what specifically you're going to be looking for. Um, and so for that prompt, we asked them to draw the Coney Island beach, anything that they, you know, notice in it and to label it as well. So then we're able to rely on some of those labels and some of those drawings that are pretty obvious like this is obviously a crab that they've drawn um, but if it does get more abstract than that then you just have to create that structure around specifically what you're looking for so yeah for something like draw a scientist um, I believe they were just looking for elements that were visual and that were pretty obvious so the fact that it's a male the fact that um, he's got like gray hair the fact that he's in a lab coat the um, fact that he's white like these are things that they were able to surmise from the drawing exactly but again if it gets more complicated and abstract it can get challenging so that's why you need that really solid structure up front and it might not be the best method for everything um, if it sounds like what you're hoping to do wouldn't translate well to that I would say go with a different method that's that's a little bit more clear cut. Okay, so then, for example, can I create like my own rubric and say, okay, they have two or three of these, two, three or more of these elements. Um, I give them these points. Or something. Yeah, okay. totally. And that's how we did it as well. So it was kind of like the presence and absence of things with the number mm -hmm. of elements that were reflected pre and post. And is there a change in those two things? So absolutely. And also you could take, um, like, so sometimes you can validate questions, right? When we say validate instruments, some people are thinking, I want to get, I need to get a whole survey in. Like, well, not necessarily. You can get questions. For example, we, the ACB, the American Society of Cell Biology, wanted us to ask a very specific question in our survey, like almost verbat verbatim, right? Mm -hmm. So we just put it in there. Mm -hmm. Um, Peter asks, how do you go about validating a new rubric like that for the drawings? I would say I probably am not the person <laughs> to answer that because I haven't done it. Um, I don't know, Jonathan, have you had experience in that? Yeah, Peter, well, I'm not in terms of a rubric for drawings, but in terms of um, uh, um, a survey. So you have to uh, calculate the, um, oh, I can't remember, the Kornbrach's alpha. Uh, by testing it on the different test populations to find out if people interpret the questions equally. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like when you're doing a, a rate of reliability test for your uh, exams, when you have to calculate the, um, oh, what is it called there? <laughs> or something, it's, uh, anyway. Um, it's very similar to that, but uh, you're, you, it's a slightly different statistical measure. We went through a statistician who knew all about it, but um, um, that's the easiest way. Awesome. Um, Thank you, the, to answer Rosaria's question, Rubik's yes are often uh, are often validated. There, it's better. The, the, the problem with with uh, new research and if you're creating new methods, it's it's not like you're not going to get published if you don't validate your tool, but it really helps if you have a validated tool. So you're know, using someone else's validated tool, even if you have to modify it, is better than coming up with something from scratch. Because then a reviewer is going to say, well, wait a minute, how are you sure that you're actually testing what you're testing? So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. that. That's an interesting point. And I would say, so... It sounds like Jonathan is a little bit more in the research space and does more publishing than I do. The work that I do is often much more evaluation focused and we're not seeking to publish. We're doing it for kind of internal 
purposes. And so in my experience, that hasn't been a necessity. And I will say in my reviewing of proposals for different entities, that is not always something that we're really concerned about, um, as long as there is a rooting in this being a type of um, you know, method that's existed in this space before, and you're kind of citing that and referencing why you chose it. It doesn't always need to be validated. But again, if you are publishing or you are in some circumstances where you do need to be validated, then absolutely um, follow Jonathan's word on that. But for more of the internal purposes, not as necessary. Well, if, if I could add to that, actually, so if you're starting something new, validating tools takes a long time. You can do what's called True. content validation. So when we started Anatomy Academy, there was, there was not a tool that existed to evaluate what our students were, were learning and what our mentors were reporting. So we did a content validation for the students part, created a tool, studied it after the fact, and now we have a tool. Um, for, the, for our mentors that were that are participating in the program, it was a simple pre-post. You don't have to, you don't have to evaluate or, or you don't have to validate a pre-post because each person acts as their own control. So that makes that super, super easy. Um, anyway, uh, just because you don't have a validated tool doesn't mean you can't do the work, uh, especially if you're not doing it for publication. But if you are doing it for publication, then you should just keep those things in mind. And, and I will admit that I'm, I'm biased that if we're doing this anyway, we might as well try to get published. Cool, thanks for that. All right, well, we are almost out of time. So I just wanna uh, head over to one more slide here. Um, am I still sharing? Uh, sorry, I, I, un I unplugged you. Go ahead, plug That's it okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try one more. Uh, just because I think this is gonna be helpful for folks. Um, because we are talking about validated measures, um, this is a nice list of repositories of validated measures in informal STEM learning and science communication that you can go to. So if you are in that circumstance where you do need something validated, check out all of these resources for um, either validated measures or really great examples of folks who have done this work before um, that you can use and adapt. Uh, question, a, Sarah, would you be able to send us the slides? Uh, that's a piece of that question. Absolutely. Perfect. And that's all uh, I have for today. And thank you all so much. Yay. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was, again, as always, very informative and like more work to do, you know, just to improve and keep growing. I think this is the message to all of us as we continue is just keep growing, keep learning. Uh, definitely a lot of work to do grounded in your logic models. Okay. I, this is my yeah, first time I'm going to say it, 2022, logic mm -hmm. model. I say it every time, <laughs> everywhere I go, okay? And we're about to have a new class of fellows, so they're going to hear me say that a lot of times. Um, you need to ground it there, figure out, you know, you can think about instruments all day long, but why? What are you trying to see? What are you trying to figure out? Get that right first. All right, Sarah, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, this was great. To next uh, in February, we'll have a next uh, another speaker. Don't know yet who that will be, but stay tuned. All right, everybody. Bye. Thanks all. Bye bye. Thank you.